Hello, everyone. Today on the final bar, we have Mark Ungerwitter from Charter Trust joining us, sharing some long-term charts, looking at some of the key big picture themes, looking at volatility at, at you know all-time lows if you look at recent history. But how does that relate to the long-term trends? Also, the uh, you know interest rates in full view right now with a lot of banks reporting earnings. Today is all about growth over value with the NASDAQ up, the Dow down, the S&P in the middle. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we try to make sense of these markets together using the power of data visualization, using stock charts to help us visualize market activity, investor sentiment, behavioral psychology, all the things that we can try to make sense of using visualizations of, uh, of price and breadth and sentiment readings. You know, today it was about the uh, the growth trade continuing, although the number one sector was utility. So, you know, when I look at this, uh, you know, these recent weeks and recent days, the word rotational just keeps coming back to me. There's no doubt the market has been higher, the S&P, in making another uh, push higher up a third of a percent today. Um, but the NASDAQ getting above, you know, the NASDAQ 100 may basically making a, uh, a new high, closing above 13,900 is a pretty significant move. The question is, does that have staying power, right? With the S&P overbought, uh, with, uh, with things like the NASDAQ breaking out, you know, is that the beginning of something more? Or is this, you know, a signal of continued chop, continued churn with growth and value rotating uh, before the market continues in its, uh, in its previous direction? We'll try to answer those questions together. We have great guests on the show. I'm always very thankful to talk to people like Mark Ungerwitter, and we'll uh, we'll share his charts here in a little while and uh, and ask his take on what he's seeing and hearing. Tomorrow on Wednesday the 14th, we have Dave Landry. On Thursday, uh, April 15th, we have Roman Bogomazov from uh, Wyckoff Analytics. Next week on Tuesday the 21st, Frank, uh, 21st, Frank Capillary from Instant is going to be joining us. And then this Saturday, we complete our week, our Options 101 week. And if you go to stockcharts.com slash options 101, you will see all the different events we have uh, slated this week. We've had some live trading rooms, some educational uh, sessions by uh, Tony Zhang from Options Play, by Joe Duarte, who's one of our Stock Charts contributors, and a live trading room with Danielle Shea uh, earlier this week. On Saturday, we're going to have a special panel featuring Price Headley, Lex Lutheringhausen, and Sean McLaughlin, all experts in options and uh, will help you uh, get started. Our, their, their, our job with that panel is to talk about how you get started trading options, learn some of the lessons they've learned from their own experiences and from coaching and mentoring others to get started with uh, equity derivatives. So check out uh, stockcharts.com slash options 101 for more info on that. Let's get to our market recap. So as I mentioned, this is a, a familiar look, I think, relative to previous days where you have the NASDAQ higher, the Dow lower, the S&P in the middle. The S&P netted out uh, with a positive move up a third of a percent. It's worth noting that mid caps and small caps both down today with the small cap index, uh, you know, continuing to lose ground down about two thirds of a percent. So, you know, this question of how high can the market go without small caps? Well, we'll see later quite a bit, right? I mean, there have been historical periods where the market can go dramatically higher with small caps underperforming. And, and there have been you know large stretches of time where that's been the case. And, and if you think about any time when we've been talking about the FANG trade, that's pretty much when that's happened, right? You, you, you were paid to own mega cap tech and consumer names and underweight small caps because it was tech and, and those sectors over things like financials and, and others that are overweighted in the small cap space. You know, financials came off today with the with the XLF, the worst of the 11 uh, S&P sector ETFs, down about 1%. Utilities number one, though, and, and this is an interesting, uh, an interesting uh, you know, read with the market going higher and utilities moving higher. And again, one day does not make a, a market trend, so don't draw too much from that. But stretches of time where something like utilities is at the top of the list is is not unexpected. And I, I always love to use the example of 2014. And I was I was doing a lecture a couple of weeks ago for the, uh, some of the students at Babson College. And I, you know, brought up the year 2014 and asked them what sector 
uh, were, you know, was the top performing sector? What sector was the second performing sector? And they guessed pretty much everything but the two right answers, which were utilities and real estate. So there can be stretches of time when uh, you know, the market overall does fine, but sectors that you would not expect are doing better than others. So as always, what I, what I remind people is, is think less about what should work or what should be happening. Focus more on what is actually happening. Focus on the trends and the momentum. And I think overall, you're going to navigate things pretty well. The VIX below 17, so it's down uh, around 1663 uh, at the end of the day today, uh, which again, long term, you know, over the last year, relatively low. Over the last 20 years, probably not that low. We'll, we'll talk about that more in a little while. Interest rates, certainly a big story with this week, right? I mean, I think the, the, the rotation away from value into growth over the last month has really been driven by interest rates that were, you know, moving higher dramatically, stalled around 170 to 180, and now have come back with the 10-year yield uh, nearing 160 again. Uh, the TLT, uh, you know, moving higher. We'll look very quickly at a chart of the, uh, of the TLT. And here we can see the, you know, the pattern. You have this bullish divergence with lower prices in March, higher uh, momentum in uh, in February to March. You flip this chart over, and that's kind of what the uh, ten-year yield looks like, with the yields going higher. And then you have a bearish divergence on the yield as yields uh, trended higher into uh, into mid-March, and the momentum was sloping downward. So a bounce higher in bonds, a, a weakening or a lowering in rates in the short term absolutely makes sense. And this is coming off a key support level for the TLT. This is going back to late 2019, early 2020. The question for me, and I think for many would be, you know, is this the, is that the bottom? And now we're gonna have this dramatic rally in bond prices, dramatic decrease in yields and, uh, and, and forget about value and going to growth. I see that as an unlikely scenario. I won't say impossible because literally anything could happen, but, I don't think we I, I, I don't think we've seen a top in rates yet, and I don't think we've seen a bottom in bond prices yet. I think at the very least we're going to retest these uh, retest these lows, which certainly would would uh, be a vote of confidence in something like financials, which have been struggling on a relative basis in the last week. Be interesting. This is obviously a week with a lot of financial stocks reporting earnings. So starting tomorrow, you have Goldman, J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Citigroup, uh, all reporting in the next couple of days. So I think uh, that might be an interesting space to watch to look for potential catalysts here. Finishing off here, our discussion, the dollar just weak by uh, by a bit using the UUP. Commodities overall stronger today with gold moving higher. Um, you know, gold obviously has been a frustrating market. Gold stocks have certainly been one of the worst groups uh, over the last six months, uh, you know, uh, really struggling. A lot of those are, are ranked very poorly using our scooter rankings. Uh, however, a bit of a bounce. And the question, uh, you know, for me is, is there enough of a bounce to uh, indicate a, a rotation into gold? I don't think we've seen that certainly just yet. Cryptocurrency is definitely accelerating to the upside with Bitcoin closing above 63,000 for the first time. Uh, this is up from uh, just below 60,000 yesterday. So, you know, continuing to see long term trajectory going higher. I don't think it's unreasonable to see Bitcoin at uh, six digits and, uh, and, and, and up into that uh, into that area for a little while. Uh, um, again, that seemed like a ridiculous um, uh, upside target not too long ago. That's become less and less ridiculous. The higher we go, the more we accelerate and gain 10,000 uh, points at a clip here. But overall, you know, these these cryptocurrencies in general uh, showing continued appreciation over the long term. Uh, and the question is always is going to be the drawdowns that you have in something like Bitcoin have been severe. So while the long term trajectory may be very, very positive, the question is how much can you stomach some of the um, the, the drawdowns that you have? You know, the one year chart, let's make it. Sorry, this I was going to say it looks like not quite enough. Let's look at the last year. So when you look at the one year chart of Bitcoin, it seems like a very reasonable uptrend. And I think the problem you have with looking at chart any chart of a cryptocurrency is you have to remember that the volatility is extreme. So these are huge swings. Uh, just these little pullbacks are, are, are you know, soul crushing turns in, the, in something going from 42,000 down to 28,000. And that's in the span of about two weeks. So these are not small moves. And so if you want to ride something like Bitcoin from 10,000 up to 60,000, you can definitely do it. You just have to be prepared for some huge drawdowns along the way. And I think that's the problem for a lot of advisors that I've worked with is just the, you know, the, the drawdowns you have in any sort of strategy. And a lot of momentum strategies, unfortunately, have you know, periods of, of deep drawdowns. You're certainly seeing that with cryptocurrency. So I think 
understanding the risk reward and understanding that your risk, your downside potential is exaggerated relative to something like a stock is something you have to be prepared for. Having said that, I think the trend overall remains positive. New, making a new all-time high, that's fantastic. Continuing to make higher highs and higher lows, that's uh, definitely encouraging. The uh, you know Bitcoin, we're using dollar sign BTC USD. It's pulled back to its 50-day moving average now just a couple times in the last six months, and both times has rebounded higher with a uh, with a fury. The last time we saw a pullback to the 50-day was there in January, accelerated to new highs and really doubled in price from 30,000 up to 60,000. I don't know if that means that's the uh, you know the the equal measurement of 52,000 up to 104,000. I think that's uh, a little, maybe a little aggressive, although it, it certainly could happen. Um, you know, for me, it's about the the trajectory, the higher highs, higher lows, certainly in place. And that's what I would uh, continue to be following. Let's finish off our discussion. Just a quick update on uh, on what we're seeing today. You know, worst sectors today, financials, consumer staples, um, and industrials. Uh, it's worth noting the top groups, automobiles, that's Tesla's group and Tesla really rotating higher. We have a question on Tesla in our mailbag segment a little later, so I'll save my comments for that. Uh, but gold mining and mining were the second and third uh, groups on there. So we'll, we'll finish there. You know, if we look at something like the GDX, the XAU, you know, there's not a lot to get really excited about just yet. And, and again, things that concern me are the fact that the RSI has petered out so far at 60. This is more characteristic of a bear market phase. If you look starting at August of last year, every time we've rallied, the RSI has failed around 60. That's what a bear market phase sort of looks like. When that reverses, when you start to get higher highs, higher lows, which we've now gotten, you get the RSI get above 60. That would be much more encouraging to me. That's what I'm looking for on the chart of the GDX and some of the key gold stocks. We need to take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with Mark Ungerwitter. See you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. It's so good to have you join us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets together. As a reminder, we do a mailbag segment twice a week. We'll do uh, one a little later in today's show. We'll do another one at the end of the week on Friday's show. Shoot us an email with any questions that are coming up in your own analysis of your own charts. Uh, shoot us an email, thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. On Twitter, just tag us in a comment at finalbarsctv. On our YouTube channel, just put a comment right below the video that you're watching. We'd love to answer one of your questions in our next mailbag segment. Also, as a reminder, stockchartstv.com, I'm sorry, stockchartstv on demand is ready to go. Go to stockchartstv.com, use your email, set up a free account, watch all of our great content from our hosts and guests. Also, you can go to any of the app stores to search for Stock Charts TV On Demand. I want to welcome on my guest, Mark Ungewitter. Mark comes to us from Charter Trust. He's been a, re a regular guest on the show, always brings a good long-term perspective. Mark, welcome back. Thanks, David. Great to be here. So it's always great to, uh, to, to hear your take on things. You know, right now we're going through what I've sort of described as a rotational period. You had this period of value performing well. All of a sudden, things are sort of changing. You have growth. Uh, spaces doing well. You have value coming off a bit. Volatility is an interesting thing to pay attention to because the VIX has come off quite a bit from where it's been. Start us there. And what are you seeing? Yeah, this is a uh, chart of uh, the S&P 500, obviously, going back to 1995 with the, with the VIX, which everybody loves. Um, we simply looked at cyclical tops <clears throat> as opposed to swing tops. And where was the VIX? And We've been saying that we we we, th we thought we'd at least see VIX 17 before we could talk about a, a cyclical top. Doesn't mean it is a cyclical top, but we note that four out of seven uh, cyclical tops did occur at, at VIX 17. Um, the last three uh, tops were much lower. Um, so it's it's kind of a matter of of regime, but it it does raise the question, uh, you know, is the easy money behind us? And we don't really need the VIX to do this, although it does raise the question. Um, we can also look at simply price and time. I think it's Larry Williams that says the VIX 
is the market upside down. Um, <laughs> I think the VIX can add value, but but um, in in many cases it, it might not even be needed. Uh, when we look at these cyclical bull markets, and if we just go back to 1987, which is kind of the post Volcker regime, the, um, the 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 price in time, in terms of price and time, um, the the average uh, the, the the median uh, cyclical bull leg is 60 percent. Today's is 79 percent so far. The average is 79 percent. Um, time there's usually much more time spent in a in a cyclical advance. Uh, than we currently have logged. We're, we're in month 13. Mm -hmm. uh, the average is in the low 30s. Um, the shortest uh, post uh, World War II case was 14 months, which was the bull market that ended in February 2020. Um, and prior to that was um, <clears throat> the, the bull market <clears throat> that ran from uh, October 1998 to March 2003. And uh, that that one's a little bit of interest, and you know, a analogs you know never really work perfectly, but but the valuation uh, characteristics uh, today, um, and and I would say the speculative character of the market, are, I think, are closest to uh, the the um, 1998 to 2000 uh, March 2000 run up. Uh, you know, it's yeah, it's interesting when you make that comparison, um, and, and and I think. You're right in terms of the sentiment, in terms of the euphoria, but also I think the the challenge, you know, you know, and I was not really investing at that point, but from you know, people I've talked to during that period, you know, the late 90s, especially 98, 99, things kept going higher, even though there seemed to be warning signs of euphoria, right? So how do we right. how do we figure out when that when that cyclical top starts to actually formulate? Well, we we can't really, unfortunately. <laughs> I'd like to say we can, but uh I you thought know, you'd have the holy grail if I asked the right question, well, Mark. We, what we do, we're, we're, we're contextual and we're asset allocators. Yeah. So, you know, the old saying is a trend follower is always fully invested in the top, but we, we can also interchange, <laughs> uh, new, you know, neutral target. You could, so if you're, if you're over your skis now, you can, you can, you know, keep an eye on the exits. You can, you can, um, you can look for things because I think the last time, two times we met, we were talking about the, the breadth thrust of, Tremendous thrust we had in uh, May 2020, early June 2020. That's and right. And so the, the general rule of thumb is, you know, you, you, for for a whole year you don't worry about the overbought's uh, unless you're a you know a, 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 a swing trader. Uh, right. But after a year, you know, the market can do anything. So I, I think again, keep you know start start to entertain the entertain the the, uh, the bearish case and, and and what divergences mean, et cetera. Now, we only have about a minute left, Mark. I did want to get to your second chart because, you know, a lot of focus on banks this week and, and the, the rise in financials have really been driven by a rise in interest rates. You have a great long-term chart sort of addressing interest rates. Talk us through this one. Right. This chart is about um, bond cyclicality, which has been pretty regular over the last you know, 40 years in this regime. Uh, the, upper, upper, the upper chart is um, um, a, it's a price chart. Uh, a continuous price chart uh, derived from uh, current coupon yield, so so we can look at a long-term history. Uh, unfortunately, the futures market, the deliverables, the deliverable uh, cash instrument has has become shorter and shorter. So it's mm. not a true uh, measure of of uh, you know third the long bond price. And then down below we have the drawdown from the high. So on the basis of the drawdown, it, it's not surprising at all that bonds are bouncing. Um, but to have you know what i would call full cyclical reversion we could easily come down to that long term trend channel support and that's about at a 2.9 to 3% yield on on the um, 30s so yeah. it's it's kind of a counterpart to that first chart you know we have do, do we do we have um, uh, you know we have the the uh, there is no alternative the tina and you know, is there is there a an alternative uh, uh, developing with bonds? It's something else to keep an eye on. Mark, we'll have to leave it there. Listen, it's always so good to have you join us. I appreciate you bringing some long term perspective and uh, stay safe, uh, those around you as well. We'll talk to you again soon. All right, thanks, Dave. That's Mark Ungewitter from Charter Trust, and uh, I love the chart. Uh, it's, it's, I hadn't. I'm sorry we didn't have more time to go through that last chart. They're looking at. Um, uh, bond prices. But again, I, you know, when I've seen yields come up so much and the TLT, which is what we usually use, comes off so much, you know, the question is, 
you know, how, how high could rates really go? And I think what you're seeing from that chart is based on that long-term trend, you could see bond prices come off uh, even more. And that would still be within the context of the appropriate uh, trend channel that we've uh, that we've seen. Great discussion on volatility as well. We need to continue on. Our next segment is the uh, final bar mailbag. We'd love to hear from you. As always, shoot us an email with any questions that come up any time of the day or night. And uh, hopefully we'll answer one of your questions in our next mailbag. Our, our email, again, is the final bar at stockcharts.com. First question comes to us from Twitter. I had posted a chart of the S&P similar to this one here and uh, had made the point that, uh, you know, the bearish divergences that we saw January, February, March really didn't, you know, play out. And you've now seen the RSI go higher, right? You've seen it break out of that divergence. You're no longer seeing a divergence between price and momentum. You're seeing both price and momentum confirming the new breakouts. That's actually a very, you know, bullish, uh, bullish signal. My comment was new highs are bullish, not overbought condition now, which suggests a short-term pullback if and when it drops out of the overbought area. And the question was, can you define what short-term stands for? And, you know, for me, I, I tend to use labels short-term, medium-term, and long-term very loosely. Uh, and that, you know, I, what I have found, I anytime I've found people that try to make the market too exact, I always question that because the markets just are not from my own experiences. There's a lot of looseness, there's a lot of wiggle room. You know, it is not a, as beautiful of a mathematical phenomenon as you may hope if you're more left-brained and more detail-oriented. It's just not. There's a lot of, uh, you know, there are a lot of unknowns, a lot of uncertainty, and a lot of moving parts, and a lot of variables. So, you know, for me, something like short-term means a couple days to a couple weeks. Medium-term is a couple months to a couple years, and long-term is beyond a couple years. And that is the general framework that I've used to think about um, you know, price movement. So when I say in the short term, it could pull back, that tells you about a couple of days to a couple of weeks. And I'm looking back at historical, you know, just in the last year, something like what we saw in June, something like what we saw even in, uh, you know, late August, early September, which, you know, again, was a was a pullback that that felt like it, right? This was 3,600 down to 3,200. That's 400 points in, uh, you know, two to three weeks. That's not, an, an, that's not nothing. However, it was still within the context of a long-term uptrend. And, you know, my guess would be something more like that. We're now, you know, uh, extending yet again away from the 200-day moving average. The RSI is overbought. The problem is, or not the problem, but the reality is, uh, you know, can the market continue to go higher? Absolutely. Well, there's, we have another question here in a little bit um, that uh, that might answer that. But again, for me, short-term, a couple of days to a couple of weeks. There, there is, you know, some people, short-term is a couple of minutes. And that's just, I, I don't even really deal too much with that very short-term time frame. Intraday for me is, is more interesting and it's interesting to see how things are fluctuating, but I think of it more in the context of what that means for the long-term trends and the long-term evolution of those. Next question, Dave, can you possibly do some work on semi-equipment makers? These stocks have been all over the map despite excellent fundamentals. There's some interesting names and charts, but breakouts are failing to gain momentum. Uh, you know, good question. What I, what I love about your question is the way you asked it, which was these stocks have been all over the map despite excellent fundamentals. You know, a lot of my career has been spent dealing or working with fundamentally oriented portfolio managers, institutional investors that focus on the fundamental stories. And, 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 you know, and before we start working together, they think that that's it, right? As long as you know good stories, you have the good companies, the good management team, the good trajectories, everything's good. As long as they grow earnings, the stock's going to go higher. And the first thing I ask people is, have you ever had a great story, a great company, everything looks perfect, and then the stock just goes down, the position totally goes against you. And of course, that happens all the time. And that's because there's a disconnect. It is not a one-on-one, -on -one, right? When you buy a stock, you're not buying their earnings, you're buying the price. And the price is driven not just by the company's performance, but it's also by supply and demand, fear and greed, all the emotional drivers of all the individual and institutional and, uh, and, and investors all pooling together and making a collective call on the stock. So I love your question where you're right, stocks can be all over the map despite their fundamentals being good. I, I certainly wouldn't suggest you ignore fundamentals. I would certainly be paying attention to um, you know, the, the, the two of them together. So when I'm thinking semiconductor equipment, the first one that comes to mind would be applied materials. It's sort of the you know, the, the larger names there. And, you know, again, if you look at the chart of applied materials, it's not bad, uh, right? If you look at the last year, it's a good chart. It's continued to make higher highs. It keeps making higher lows. It could actually pull back quite a bit. The 50-day is still 20 points away from where we're at right now and still be within a pretty good uptrend. Even if you draw a trend line from the October 
and March lows, we're still pretty far away from there, right? We have a little bit of, of room. So overall, I don't think they're broken. I think the charts, um, you know, are, are in decent shape. I think the question is how much of a pullback do you get in this little move here? And, and, and are you comfortable with it? At some point, you break down through those, those levels. And if you think of something like Goldman Sachs, which is a, a timely stock looking uh, for them reporting earnings tomorrow morning, it's a little further down, down to its 50-day moving average. And, and stocks holding their 50-day during a pullback, I would argue pretty important because if it doesn't, that's where a lot of uh, people would start to question the long-term trend. At this point, uh, the trends are still good. You know, Other names that come to mind would be like LRCX, uh, not bad. It's actually pretty good. Just recently made a new high. I think that's a really good, uh, really good chart. Looks a lot like KLAC, uh, right? Which is this one. Um, I, you know, but when I think of semiconductors, the chart that is interesting to me is NVIDIA. I'm going to continue to highlight this one as long as it makes uh, myself look good from the chart madness special, because this is one that I said, uh, it, buy NVIDIA, sell Intel. And so far, that's been a decent, uh, decent call. I will stop highlighting this once it stops working. But for now, uh, uh, as one of my former uh, bosses used to say, we don't talk about short-term performance unless it's in our favor. So I will do that there. But that is tongue-in-cheek. Semi semiconductor equipment, I think, overall look pretty good. And I think the relative strength there would be uh, really key to watch. Is Tesla a buy now that it's back above the 50-day moving average? So I would not tell you a specific recommendation like that, but I will certainly make an observation. So there's no doubt that Tesla regaining its 50-day is one of a number of things that I think that look pretty compelling here. Um, you know, getting back above this resistance is pretty important. You know, if you look at it, Tesla had broken down through uh, around 700. Let's zoom in just a little bit. You can see that um, on a little more detail. So stock rallied up here, kind of came down, and then has been testing that 700, 7, uh, you know, 20 range for, uh, you know, about a month now, four or five weeks. And I think breaking out of that range after making a higher low here in late March, breaking out, I think is encouraging. Getting back above the 50 days, encouraging the relative strength, turning higher, all of that is positive and it's not yet overbought. I have to agree that this is a pretty... Uh, pretty decent chart. So while I celebrated my NVIDIA call so far, I will lament the fact that I said Ford over Tesla. And so far, Tom Boley, you are right. Tesla is doing uh, much, much better than the Ford that I uh, that I suggested. That's all the time we have for the, uh, the uh, mailbag segment here today. We'll gather more questions. If you have them, just shoot us an email, thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We'd love to answer your question on Friday's show. Let's wrap the show. Go to the three and three, three charts, three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one is the S&P 500 with new highs and new lows. So in green are new highs on the New York Stock Exchange, the first panel below the price. The bottom panel has the new highs on the S&P 500. So the reason why I'm showing this is you continue to see an expansion in new highs. Now, there have been more. When you looked in February and March, you had a lot more. So you had about you know, at the most about 20% of the S&P making a new high here, but we're not far off of that, right? On the, on the, on the jumps higher, you're getting 15, 16% of the S&P. That's what we saw uh, on, uh, on Monday. So today at about 10% of the S&P making a new high, that's not bad. Continuing to see an increasing number of new highs is encouraging. Continuing to see uh, a healthy amount of new highs as the uh, S&P is where it is, is very encouraging. New highs on the New York Stock Exchange increasing is probably more important because that shows you it's not just the mega caps, but other things as well. Where you're not seeing relative strength is on small caps. This is the ratio of small caps versus large using the IWM over the SPY. You can see that ratio had been in a steady uptrend until the second week in March. For the last month, that's been in a downtrend. This is shown, you know, this is really the, the retreat in financials, the pullback in interest rates, the rise of the growth trade again, the FANG stocks working. That's what make, making this ratio go down. I would be keenly watching that if you're looking at some of those uh, non-growthy sectors, because that would most likely want to go up uh, for you to feel good about only things like financials. Finally, the VIX. I thought Mark did a great job, Mark Ungerwitter, uh, talking about the long-term trend in, uh, in volatility. Having a proper long-term perspective, you know, a lot of times we look at things like this looking at the last year, and I've, I've seen people that talk about, you know, an all-time low, they basically imply an all-time low in volatility. And, you know, if you compare where we're at now to one year ago, yes, we are very much at the lower end of where we've been over the last year. But if you look over the long term, you know, volatility can go much, much lower, especially during an extended, an extended bull market period. The question is, is it more like some of these cyclical Topping patterns that we've seen where a VIX below 20 sort of lines up with those historical cyclical tops, or is this the beginning of a new volatility regime? That's what I'd be focusing on there. Folks, that is our show for today. Thanks so much for joining us every weekday after the close. 
for the final bar. Special thank you to Mark Ungerwitter from Charter Trust. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a good night. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.